move that out of the way. Oh, hello everybody. I am, um, as you might be able to hear, I'm feeling a little bit under the weather, to say the least. I've come down with a horrific bout of man flu. I say horrific, I, I just don't feel very well. I'll be fine. I have done you the courtesy though of, of getting dressed for this video. I did consider doing it in my pajamas, but I thought that might not take you fancy. So uh, yeah, I decided to at least attempt to make myself look presentable. James, shut up, get on with it. <laughs> this is lemon and honey and it's really, really nice. By the way, I hope you don't mind me just sort of sitting back and having my feet up in this video. It, it sort of feels better to be uh, just chilled, relaxing like this. And the first question, or type of question, is uh, about what my thoughts are on Unsplash. So Unsplash, for those of you who don't know, is uh, it's basically a stock site where you don't actually have to pay for photos. Photographers upload to Unsplash and pretty much sign over all of their rights and say it's fine for anybody to use this image for anything for free and, uh, and then anyone can download that image and use it for commercial purpose or, or personal purposes, whatever. Um, and lots of photographers, commercial photographers or photographers who've, who've earned their living with kind of stock images and stuff have, have expressed lots of concerns about this kind of site. And it kind of, it reminds me of um, Uber. And I guess there are two sort of interesting similarities between something like Uber and Unsplash. <laughs> <laughs> the first similarity is that for the end user, on the surface at least, it seems to be a better proposition than what currently existed. So Uber is, is cheaper and, and quicker and more convenient in a lot of cases than normal taxis. And Unsplash is certainly cheaper and more convenient than, uh, than, the, <coughs> than the typical stock site. And for that reason, they, they both seem to have taken off and the sky seems to be the limit for both those, those services. Um, the other similarity that I see between them is that they both have licensing and legal issues potentially bubbling under the surface. So Ubers have been pretty well documented. Um, sometimes the drivers have complained about the fact that they're not treated as employees because of you know contract disputes or because they're not entitled to you know, holiday pay and things. They're treated as, as self-employed when, when actually they should be employed. As I say, I'm not a lawyer. I don't really know the ins and outs, but you don't have to read too many headlines to find one that's talking about Uber not being great for employees or not paying their licenses to cities and, and things like that. Unsplash has not had that kind of problem kind of bubble up yet, as far as I'm aware, but you don't have to look at too many photos on Unsplash to start questioning whether all the images on there have things like model releases or property releases, and that in the future could have huge implications for either the end users that are using the images without these releases that are, are required if you use them in commercial situations potentially or the photographers getting in trouble because they're posting these photos and handing over all the rights when they don't have the rights to the models and the properties in the first place um, that's just one example of, of where there might be issues uh, and that's kind of the two places that I see similarities between something like Uber and Unsplash there are a couple of ways of looking at that I guess you could say that um, both Uber and Unsplash are trailblazers and these kind of legal issues are just kind of creases that they need to iron out or you could say that they're, they're going to cause the new business models to crumble. I think I probably take the view that they're, they're more creases that will be ironed out over time um, because they are so popular because they're so much better for the end user and as a result of that if, if I happen to be right then anybody or any photographer who earns a significant amount of their money from the kind of images that you might see on Unsplash, then they might have to rethink that part of their business because I think it's gonna get trickier and trickier to earn money for those kinds of photos um, going forward with, with services like Unsplash because I don't think it'll be long before Unsplash has many, many other websites competing with it for, uh, for eyeballs. Uh, next question is about vlog setup. So I get asked a lot about vlog setup. Um, I use a Panasonic G85, I've been using it for about 10 months, and usually I use that with a Lumix 12 to 60, 3.5 to 5.6 lens. Uh, although in the past few weeks, I've been using the G85 with the 12 to 35 2.8 from Panasonic, which I bought mainly for stills, but it's also cracking for video, it's what's on the camera now. Um, now also, traditionally, traditionally, now I usually strap this to the bottom of the camera, which is just a little tripod that folds up 
to be a sort of handheld selfie stick type thing. But a few weeks ago, Joby sent me this, and I've had loads of Gorilla Pods in the past. I've never had one of these though, which is a three, um, it holds three kilos, basically, which is more than enough for my G9, which should be coming in the next week or two, and uh, and the longest lens that I plan on using with the G9. You can get a 5kg version of this, um, but I didn't need a 5kg version. It's a bit bigger and heavier, and wouldn't have fit in my, um, in my retrospective 30, so this this was the best option for me. Uh, in terms of sound, which I always moan about, so don't necessarily take my lead with sound, but I've been using recently this this um, Rode Video Mic Go, which is currently on a, a mic stand that I bought the other day. Made by Amazon Basics, would you believe it? Uh, it was like 15 quid, which is pretty good. But usually I use a Video Mic Pro, uh, which is currently in the, the microphone hospital getting serviced. Should be with me in the next couple of days though, so I'll switch back to that. Um, yeah, that's pretty much my vlogging setup. I don't have um, a GoPro or anything that I, I ever use. Uh, I don't have a drone that I use, but Emily and I are currently considering moving to the countryside later this year, and if that happens, then I, I will definitely get a drone. Um, so yeah, I keep it, keep it pretty simple with my vlogs as, um, well, as you can probably tell. Next question, do you mind vlogging in front of people? Uh, yes, yes, I really don't like it. I feel, I feel very uncomfortable holding a camera out with a big microphone with a stupid wind muff on it, um, walking down the street talking while people are kind of looking at me. I'm very aware of it. Certainly less so than I used to be when I first started out. I was a complete wreck when I first started out. I'm a little bit better now. I find that I'm, I don't know, I find it much easier when I'm somewhere like a busy city to do it, strangely enough, than, than when I'm like up a mountain with one other person on the path coming towards me. I find that much more awkward than if I'm in a really crowded place where you know people have got their own things going on, they're, they're too conscious of their own lives to pay any attention to what you're doing. Um, whereas if you're somewhere sort of much quieter and there's only one or two other people about, I feel very conscious about getting a camera out and starting talking to it then uh, because they're much more likely to talk to you while you're doing that and ask you about what the hell are you doing. So um, yes, I do feel uncomfortable. Slowly but surely I'm getting more comfortable, but I couldn't I couldn't really just you know walk down the street and, and not notice other people around me uh, yet, which is hopefully what I'll get to in the not too distant future. Are your recent photos on Instagram what you'd call landscape photography? A few people have asked questions like this. Um, I think it's because there are loads of photographers on YouTube particularly that are focused on landscape photography and, and landscape photography I guess you would think is photography of landscapes. But the photographers that I'm thinking of, people like um, Thomas Heaton for example, have uh, quite a strict methodology and, and quite a strict way of, of working and taking photos. So, you know, they'll take a lot of time and effort finding um, the best composition. And at that point, they'll set up a tripod, uh, they'll get their filters ready, they'll get a cable release ready, and everything will all be very precise and um, full of intent. And I don't really work like that. I've never really worked like that. I kind of prefer to, to walk around with a camera, seeing what I see and, and snapping away, and then I, I get home and, and find out what I've got. Um, so I guess in some ways, some of the photos that I take are, are kind of landscape photography, um, in that they're photos of landscapes, but in the, the techniques that I use and the, the way I go around getting photos, it's probably a bit of a departure from, from what some people consider to be landscape photography. So. Uh, I don't know, to be honest. How many photos do you take a day? Are you not just looking for one photo? Okay, so that kind of ties into the, the landscape photography thing, and I think it comes from a video that I did the other week where I mentioned that I'd taken like 1,200 photos before lunch. I've already taken 1,200 images today. So to be honest, that was, that was on the high side of how many photos I might get in a day. Um, I was bracketing by five exposures, which means that you can divide by five that number of photos for the, uh, the number of exposures that I was really getting. And that's partially different perspectives, but it's also the same perspective and wanting to make sure that I've got a pin sharp shot and the best moment when maybe a car goes past or a person goes past or, or something along those lines. And a quick tip, I guess, when you're working like that and you've got loads and loads of photos when you get home and you're editing through them, is if you've got, say, 100 shots that are all from the same location and you're just trying to pick the best one, I've found that, you know, typically what most people want to do is go from the start and go right through all of them and try and pick the best. What I do though is I start from the back 
because towards the back I think I'm more likely to have thought that I've got the shot because I mean I've, I've decided to move on so I think it's likely that I've got the shot towards the back. The middle's never really full of anything, the reason I carried on towards the, the you know 50th and 100th photos are that I didn't get anything in the middle so I never really look at the photos in the middle and sometimes the photos at the beginning are pretty good too because you know you've, you've just rocked up and you're not thinking too much and uh, yeah, I just find sometimes at the start of the batch, that's when you get the best photos, but more often than not, the best photos come sort of at the, the end of the batch of, of... Does that make sense? Have you delved much into film photography? Um, sadly, no. No, I really haven't. And, and I guess off the back of this last question about me taking like 1,200 photos in a day, I really should because I think it'd be good for my patience and my practice and, and sort of settling on a composition before I just snap away and not wasting shots and wasting time when I come to edit photos because I'm having to go through hundreds of files. So I think this year I will definitely make a conscious effort to get more into film photography and I'm sure I'll, uh, I'll bring you along for the journey as I do that. Have you ever used a rangefinder camera? Yes. Uh, a couple of years ago I spent a day with my friends Leica. Um, I can't remember what it was, but I loved it. Um, I think it was actually a whole weekend that I spent with it. I just loved it so much it only felt like a day. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I'd love one, but Emily would kill me if I spent that much money on a camera, I think. I did look briefly for a period of time at the Fuji X Pro 2, is it? Um, and I really like that camera, but I just love stabilization. So um, so yeah, it may be that in a few years time, Fuji brings out a camera that's a, a rangefinder style camera with stabilization, in which case I'll, uh, I'll be very interested in seeing it. Do you need a photography style? Um, I think I'll get into that in another video. I think that warrants a whole video by itself. How do you pronounce your name? That is a genius question, because I don't think it's ever come up. I don't think I've ever had to say my name properly. Uh, James Popsis is how you say it, Popsis. I don't know if you've seen Sarah Dietschy on YouTube, but she has this thing where she's like, hi, I'm Sarah Dietschy, rhymes with peachy. So yeah, maybe I need to be like, hi, I'm James Popsis, rhymes with pop sister. Do you get nervous leaving your camera lying around when you're making videos? Um, no, not really. I'm, I'm very careful to leave my camera just sort of lying around. I don't, I don't typically leave it in very busy places or anywhere that I can't see it for um, a good period of time. Like I, I very rarely leave a camera on the floor for more than, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds. Uh, and I'm always careful to make sure that if there's anyone around that I think I can outrun them if, uh, if they were to steal my camera. So, so no, I don't really get too nervous because I am quite careful, but um, yeah, I can't really afford to just lose cameras or get cameras stolen all the time. So I do make sure that I can, I can outrun everyone I can see. Favorite kind of cake? Ooh, um, coffee cake. Definitely coffee cake. Or pecan pie. Does that count? I know that's a pie, but it's, it's my favorite sort of cake type thing. How accessible is Wales by train and bus? I don't want to drive on the left. Uh, yep, yeah, fair point. So Wales, I mean, it depends what part of Wales you go to. So if you're coming internationally, the chances are you'll arrive in London or maybe Manchester by air. And uh, to get to North Wales, which is where I am for, for most of those videos in Wales, you can get a train from London, which is two hours and 50 minutes, which is pretty good. And London, South Wales is probably about the same. From Manchester to get to North Wales, it's like an hour and a half maybe on the train or bus maybe two hours again, which again, yeah, not really any time at all. Trouble is when you get to sort of the towns on the coasts in Wales, so either Cardiff in the south or like London no, um, in the north, then buses and trains and stuff become a bit less predictable and, and useful. And it's at that period that you, you really probably do need to get over your fear of driving on the left and, and hire a car. But the good news is that the roads around there are super quiet and you don't need to worry about traffic or anything. It's not like you're kind of driving in a city. Um, so yeah, getting to Wales, fine. But roaming around in Wales, you, you probably do want your own car, to be honest. Uh... Uh, any photography travel plans this year? Nothing confirmed at the moment, but I'm working on stuff. Uh, how do you feel about the Canon 80D? Loads of people ask me about the Canon 80D. I've never, I've never used one or owned one, but uh, I've heard lots of good things, particularly about the autofocus. So um, there's probably someone else that can help you more with a Canon 80D, to be honest. Photoshop lessons. Are you going to offer Photoshop lessons? Maybe. I spoke about this a little bit at the end of last year, I think, about doing some sort of Photoshop course. 
I keep blowing hot and cold with that idea. I don't really know what I'm thinking about it at the moment. I'm wondering if the best way to go in terms of tutoring would be one-to-one -one Skype type calls. The trouble with doing Photoshop lessons on, on YouTube is that you don't always get the biggest viewerships. They're very time intensive and you don't always hit the absolute nail on the head with what people are hoping to learn because everyone wants, wants something different. So um, yeah, I'm trying to work out how I can best help individual people with, with exactly what they want to know. And uh, yeah, maybe maybe Skype would be the way to do that. But also, like, you know, those Skype calls wouldn't just have to be about Photoshop, they could be about anything. So let me know if that's of interest. What sort of jobs do you do? What sort of clients do you work for? Good question. I don't really talk about uh, my commercial deals and, and work with brands and stuff all that often. Um, I, in fact, don't even have an area on my site at the moment where I've listed my clients. That's probably something I should think about. Uh, so last year I did a really broad range of things actually, consider it was my first year. I did like album covers for bands. I work with um, tourist sites, places like Covent Garden. I did some work for Adobe. I did quite a big campaign for Chipotle. A couple of small campaigns for an online clothing company. And right now I'm doing a big-ish campaign for a, uh, an online payments company that you would definitely have heard of use it to pay for stuff on eBay. Uh, you've said in the past that you like gray skies and flat light for landscapes. Why is this? Good question. Um, so when you're compositing, and a lot of the work that I've done is, is compositing, like stitching multiple images together, shadows are your worst nightmare, basically. Trying to match shadows from different images can be a real pain because often you've got different light sources or light sources from different directions. And yeah, shadows are a pain. And when you're working with flat light, the shadows are softer and generally much easier to fake than when you have really harsh light. So that's kind of where my, my love of soft dull grey light came from. But that said also, when it comes to things like landscape photos, I think nowadays I also prefer grey and, and flat light there because I've got to a point where I'm just a bit bored of seeing photos of sunrises and sunsets. Like there are, there are only so many photos you can see, I think, or it certainly seems to be the case for me, where the story is, is the colour of the sunrise or the sunset. You know, after a while, when you've seen that much orange sky and purple sky and I don't know, I just, I need something else. And I think what I like about Grey Sky is that it forces the story to be about something other than the color of the light. You know, it means that you need to maybe think out of the box a bit and there needs to be a subject that's gripping in another way other than kind of shiny, saturated light. And um, I think I quite like that idea. So, so I don't mind the fact that I'm in Britain where, I don't know, 80% of our days are overcast because, you know, it forces you to, to think about how to make a photo look interesting and, and beautiful while uh, while the skies aren't necessarily conventionally pretty. Would you spend money on a 24 to 70 or a 35 mil prime? Uh, I think I'll do a video in a few weeks time about prime versus zooms. I'd say broadly that particularly if you're starting out, prime lenses are fantastic because you generally have to think more about the shot when you're composing and, uh, and that can kind of make for a, a much steeper learning curve and, and help your skills improve much more quickly. I think when you, certainly when you're beginning, um, you can look to compose using a zoom much more easily and you can kind of cheat your way out of, of some situations and, and not learn as much. So I think primes are good in that regard. Um, unless, of course, you're in a position where you, you can't zoom with your feet, so to speak. So prime users love to say you're being lazy if you're not using a zoom because you're, you're not zooming with your feet. But you can't zoom in or out in all situations with your feet because, you know, if you're stood at the edge of a lake and you want to zoom in, you're not going to walk into the lake. Uh, and if you're stood with your back to the wall and want to zoom out, you can't get any further back. So it's not a perfect theory, but um, generally speaking, I'd say primes, certainly for beginners, are a better tool and uh, often result in more, more pleasing images because more thought has gone into them. Not always the case, but um, as I say, I'll do a video about primes versus zooms. And last question today, because um, I need to go to bed, I feel horrific, is uh, Instagram 500px or Flickr? Okay, so I go to Flickr generally for location scouting. I go to 500px for technically very good images, um, just to see what people are up to and what sort of techniques they might be employing to get the very best technical images. 
and I go to Instagram for stories. Not Instagram stories, I go to Instagram to look at the pictures which are more so about storytelling I find than, than pictures on, on the other sites. Uh, particularly with captions, people seem to put a lot of effort into captions on Instagram where maybe on the other sites they don't. That might not be a fair comment. Uh, in my experience that's, that's just what I've found. Um, so yeah, um, I'm well aware that there are loads of questions that I've not covered. Um, I've tried to kind of get to a lot of the topics that were, that were asked and at least vaguely answer a lot of people's questions. I'll do one of these every single month. Hopefully I'll sound a lot better and uh, more healthy than I do right, right now um, in the next one. But um, yeah, I felt like I should do it rather than not do it because it wouldn't set a very good precedent if I, if I missed the very first one. Uh, until the next time, when hopefully I don't look like I'm going to die, see you later.